Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to today's web conference. This is Dynamics 365 Fast Track Tech Talk. Today's topic, solution development. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. If you do not consent to be a part of a recorded session, we ask that you please disconnect your browser at this time. Attendees may access the web conference recording at the same registration site within 24 hours. We encourage you to use the messages panel at any time to ask questions regarding content or to request support. To do so, please click on the messages button at the bottom of your screen, type your question into the white text box, and click send. Our presenter is going to be holding all of the questions until after the presentation has been concluded, so we do appreciate your patience while uh, we wait to do those. We also use the messages tab to post announcements to the audience, so please take a look there now for some important information regarding this event. Ladies and gentlemen, our event production team strives to be a leader in delivering online content. We ask that you please help us reach this goal by providing feedback. Towards the end of the session, a survey URL is going to appear on the left-hand side of your screen. Simply click that URL, enter your email, and select your responses. We appreciate the time you take to do this, and thank you for your support. I'd also like to thank you for your patience during these announcements. There's going to be a brief pause while I start the recordings. Hello and welcome to today's web conference. This is Dynamics 365 Fast Track Tech Talk. Today's topic, solution development. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Senior Fast Track Program Manager, Chris Knowles. So without any further delay, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Janice, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, as Janice said, my name is Chris Knowles, and I have been with Microsoft for a little over five years. All of that time spent in the dynamic space uh, focused on CRM. And today we will be talking about uh, solution development. Uh, what we'd like to be able to talk about today is customizations, uh, extensions. We'll talk some about best practices, and then uh, I'll give you some information about resources, and, of course, we will do question and answer. We should run somewhere today in the, in the time frame of one to two hours, and we're hoping that as we complete today's session, you'll have a good sense of how to perform customizations in Dynamics 365 using the out-of-the-box features, that you'll have a good understanding of, of how to begin to develop plugins, integrations, uh, leverage JavaScript for customization, and then create custom actions for Dynamics 365. We'll also review the best practices when you are looking at developing solutions and developing for Dynamics 365. So for customizations, uh, some things that are important with this are understanding how to manage and deploy customizations, customizing entities, and that means adding fields and relationships within the platform, building forms for user to input and retrieve data, uh, implementing business rules, uh, presenting information and views, and then, of course, exporting and importing tools. So what is a solution? A solution is a container for customization. And this means basically it's a, it's a package that keeps uh, entities, fields, web resources, and other things that are all part of the customizations for your particular implementation. Uh, a solution is not required. We do have what we call the default solution, which is a, just a large open solution, but it, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily organize and keep things kind of containerized for you. So solutions do help when you, when you actually want to begin to create uh, certain aspects of what will be in your implementation. Uh, the default solution, as I mentioned, contains all of the system components, uh, as well as uh, other out-of-the-box things, and then potentially anything that you put in this customization. Uh, you do have the ability to export a solution from your Dynamics instance as either managed or unmanaged. And if you'd like more information on that, we cover that in much more detail in our application lifecycle management uh, tech talk. But you should also, you should really invest some time in understanding the two different types of solutions and how you would like to use them depending on the development model that you choose to implement. So when you look at solutions and you want to understand uh, what they are, one of the things that's really important in dealing with solutions is understanding that all solutions are tied to a publisher. Uh, these are critically important because this helps you identify uh, who is responsible for putting these changes into the system. Uh, you can create a version number uh, you can put up the four numbers separated by decimals, and then, of course, you, you know, want to use that as kind of a tracking between, like, major and minor versions 
that you would typically have when you develop software. Uh, you want to make sure that you understand when you're creating a, a solution that once you've created that, you can't go back and change those base values. You would have to either update the solution by creating a copy of the solution and then changing the version number or potentially creating a new solution uh, that you would then put on top of the solution that you're developing. What's in a solution? So there are a lot of different components that go into the solution. So pretty much everything that's containerized within your Dynamics implementation for a given instance uh, is one of these types of components. So within that, we have the, the schema, which represents the data, if you will, uh, which are encapsulated as entities, uh, fields within entities, relationships, and option sets. Then we also have templates, email templates, contract templates, article templates, uh, mail merge uh, templates as well. Uh, on the user interface, we provide forms, views, uh, charts, dashboards, uh, the sitemap, uh, ribbons, command ribbons for your different forms, and then, of course, your, app, your, your apps that go in there as well. Um, and then, you know, whether you have uh, custom processes or uh, custom code, things like uh, assemblies that, that relate to uh, creating plugins or workflows or dialogues or business process work, uh, any number of these things that you see uh, here on the right side. Uh, and then lastly, uh, in kind of a general category of security roles, field security profiles, uh, connection roles, which, you know, kind of identify what type of, of, of uh, entity you're connecting to, uh, like a, a contact could be a salesperson or it could be uh, an employee or it could be uh, a stakeholder for a project, as an example, reports, uh, system, system settings, and then uh, you have your, your SLA for, uh, of course, your, uh, your support case. So what is entity customization? Uh, within the world of dynamics, an entity is a, uh, it's basically a type of record. Uh, you know, system entities, for example, are account, case, uh, article, business unit, uh, contact, uh, project, all of those types of things. And they basically represent, if you will, uh, an, uh, an a table uh, in a database. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that in the actual underlying, but you can think of it that way. And then within the entity, you have records. So each record that is stored within that entity uh, can represent an account or a contact or a case, and it will allow you to uh, store and maintain that information. And then, of course, related to that entity is metadata that describes the entity uh, and how the, the information in the entity is presented to a user. And then, of course, within a record, you have a field. Uh, we also reference them as uh, attributes, or you can think of them as a column uh, in, a, in a database table or a column in the entity table, as we refer to it. So what is a form? A form is a, is a visualization of a single record. A uh, pretty standard thing, it, it, it translates the same across all software development. But a form basically has the ability to take the information that is in a single record of an entity and display it and allow you that form to interact with the user so that they can add information into a form, they can update information on a form. Uh, of course, they can use that form to uh, uh, make modifications or potentially have other information that's related to that information, uh, which we call subgrids. Uh, you have the ability to do all of these things in a way that presents information to your to your users in the most efficient way possible. And then lastly, uh, a view. And what a view allows you to do is to display a list of records from an entity. So, for example, a list of contacts. And then you have the ability also to filter uh, the information that's on a view, and you can control what columns are presented uh, within the view as well. Um, so with entities, we also have uh, system entities, and a lot of our system entities are built-in entities that are created as part of the deployment. Uh, some can be modified, some cannot. Uh, you can go and look at the information on that particular entity to tell you whether or not uh, it can actually be changed. Uh, if, if it cannot be changed, then it, it will tell you that, and it will also tell you that it cannot be uh, cannot be locked down or, or, or managed by a, a separate managed solution. And then, of course, you have the ability to create your own custom entities. Uh, these can be created uh, within the tool, 
or they can be created as part of a solution import. Uh, but these are where you may need information that is related to other information that you have in the system uh, that's not represented by one of the entities that is, is provided out of the box. So when you go to create an entity uh, within the tool, you actually have to provide certain pieces of information that will then allow the system to create a representation of that entity so that you can begin to store information in it, uh, including things like the entity name, uh, the entity display name. So when we reference the entity uh, within our views and, and within dashboards and within other presentations, uh, you can say this would be, uh, for example, uh, maybe you're, you're keeping track of uh, a list of vehicles that um, that are available to salespeople, right? just as an example, making something up. And so there's not an entity within Dynamics that represents that out of the box, so you would create a new entity. So when you do that, you would give the, the, the new entity a name, like salesperson vehicles, and then you would say, how is that entity going to be represented to users? And that's called the display name. And then, of course, we also give you the option to add a plural for that as well, and when you see the navigation of use, that's what will be represented. Uh, you can define if there's a specific image related to that entity or a color and or a color. Um, you can also specify whether it's a virtual entity, which means that it can be set up to be related to uh, an external API where it can go and retrieve information dynamically or whether it's actually contained within the dynamic system. Uh, who owns the entity and how it's owned? Uh, and then, of course, uh, activity settings, so whether or not there are activities that can be associated with it, and then of course the description of it. Um, other things that can be that can be set on the entity as well within these checkboxes, or whether it's available for communication and collaboration, data services, whether it's available with an Outlook or mobile, um, and then of course what processes are associated with that particular entity. Once you've gone through and you've created customizations, uh, what you then have to do is publish them. And basically, publication is the act of taking that entity information uh, or the information that you've created as customization and then actually applying it uh, to be broadly available within your Dynamics instance. Uh, there's a number of ways to accomplish this, but when you go and you do this, so for example, if you go in, you create a new entity, you may create some other things around that entity, you may create attributes for that entity, and then, of course, a form, and you're going to want to publish that so that your users can then see it. Uh, once you publish it, everything becomes visible uh, out within the actual implementation that you have. Um, and once you do that, you, uh, everything goes published all at once. So everything that you have in its customizations, when you click publish, it, you can click publish all customizations, and it will publish all of them. Uh, you have to make sure that once you make changes, you do publish those changes, because otherwise it can, it can have an impact if you choose not to do that. But once you do that, you can kind of take it from a mindset of saying, okay, I, I now have this group of changes I'm ready to pu publish out to my community. Now, this could just be in a development instance, for example, where you're working on something as a developer and you have all of this stuff that you've worked on and now you're ready to put it out there so that it's part of the broader uh, solution that is, is in your development. And then that would become part of the solution that's, that's taken out and then migrated to your QA instance, for example. So you have to make sure, too, that when you publish uh, customizations and you want them to appear in, in, in tablets or on, in mobile, you want to make sure that you that you always publish them and that you you, you make sure that, that every time that happens, that those are synchronized uh, with the Dynamics uh, 365 micro tablets application. One thing you do have to understand related to publishing customizations is you don't want to publish customizations within a system whenever there is normal system functionality going on, because it's a, it's a rather intensive process for taking those customizations and then putting them out so that they're ready to be used. Uh, the thing that you need to consider in publishing customizations, especially in a production environment, is that you want to schedule those uh, in off-hours times. And if you're in a 24 by 7 environment, we recommend that you schedule those publication windows uh, as you would normally schedule maintenance windows or plant outage windows, uh, et cetera, as part of your uh, implementation. So, order fields. Pretty much if you're familiar with, with, with the concept of, of columns in a database, 
uh, columns in a table related to a data patient. Basically, that's what a field is. Uh, a field is a single, a single piece of information related to that entity. And uh, when you go and you create the field, it actually allows you to define the type of a field. Uh, it will show up uh, as a control on a form. Um, it would be used as a display column in a view. It can be used as part of a query. Uh, and then basically it translates to a column that's related to that entity in a SQL database. Uh, we also refer to them as attributes, as I mentioned before. What types of fields are available? So when you look at uh, when you look at the types of fields that you can create uh, within within Dynamics for a particular entity, uh, there are a, a number of different types of fields you can create. Uh, you have the ability to create um, what we call a, a customer field, which relates to a customer record that could point to either an account or a contact record. Uh, that's very handy, for example, in an opportunity where you may not have an actual customer yet, but you, you do have someone who would represent the customer, and that would be a contact versus an account. You have the ability to determine whether it's an account or a contact when you go onto the form and you add it. Uh, a multi-select option set. So this is where you may have a list of values uh, that you want to provide your user as options on a, on a particular on a particular field. So, you know, for example, maybe uh, a, type of, uh, a type of customer, as an example, and you have uh, three, four, five different types, and maybe you have uh, one type that's available that you want them to select, or you could have multiple types that you want them to select. And you can actually present this in a, in a multi select option set. Uh, a single line of text, this basically translates to uh, an end bar chart. If you see here, we, we represent the actual SQL data type that's used underneath the coverage for these, for these particular field types. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that, for example, uh, if you just want to have them enter um, a short note or something, a quick, a quick description of something, then you could use what we call single line of text. It contains up to 4,000 characters, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very powerful for just containing uh, bits of unstructured information. <clears throat> An option set. This is similar to the multi-select option set, except that there's only one option available to select. And basically, you would create the list of values you can order them. Uh, you can assign them uh, an internal value for representation and ordering. And then, of course, when that is presented on the form, uh, it will show up as a, as a drop down, and then they can pick a value from that, and that's the value that they put in the field. Uh, a two option select is basically a yes no or a true false. Uh, it's basically an option set with just yes and no. Uh, it does have some specific identifiers, and as you can see, it is stored slightly differently. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately, it's, it's designed to be just atomic and either on or off uh, with, with how it's represented. You can create whole numbers, uh, floating point numbers, decimal numbers, uh, as well as numbers that represent currency specifically. Uh, you can also create uh, uh, multiple lines of text uh, fields. So, for example, a, a, a long description of, of an account or potentially, um, you know, a, a brief notes field on opportunity versus using our, what we call an identity. Uh, a date time field, which can store the date and the time. Uh, and then, of course, a lookup which will represent uh, potentially a, a good value that could point to another entity that has a relationship to the entity that you're currently dealing with. Uh, in terms of field creation, uh, basically when you go to create a new field, you would go to the entity, you could then pull that entity up, and then you would have the list of fields, and then you could then tell it to add a field at that point. It allows you to enter in specific information about that field and how that field is handled and managed and how it's represented. Uh, and then, of course, you know, what you can do as part of versioning is be able to track notes for that particular field and information. You can also create the information related to it if it's an option set uh, or other controlling information depending on what type of field you're choosing to create. So when you create uh, option sets, multi-select option sets, and two option fields, uh, it will store the numeric value that relates to that particular that particular type of, uh, of option set, uh, but the, it will be represented as a label. They are stored as integers. Uh, when you do a multi-select, it basically stores an integer array. Uh, you would not want to, you know, just for the sake of performance, I wouldn't recommend uh, on a multi-option select going above the 150 options that you could select. But 
uh, certainly, you know, you want to manage that, but you can put a, a significant number of options in there, uh, and then you just want to balance whether or not it makes sense that uh, that's an option, it's an option set, or whether it actually translates to a lookup in another uh, in another entity. And then the two options, of course, is stored as a bit field, uh, and typically it's represented as yes or no. But you can also configure a default value, so when it pops up on the form, uh, it can uh, it can have a value of not assigned, or it can have an op and it can have an optional default value. Um, you cannot create a default value for a multi-select because, of course, that's kind of contrary to the purpose of it being a multi-select option set. Um, and then, of course, the, you have to select the value for uh, the, the the two options select. Uh, it cannot be a null; it has to be either zero or one. Uh, you can also define minimum and maximum values. So, for example, uh, if you are if you are adding a, a numeric field in, and there is a range of values in which you can set, you can actually define those, and then it will the system will will throw an error if someone enters uh, in a value that's outside of that range. Um, another thing that's important to know on numeric fields is, is the precision. So, of course, no on whole numbers, there's not a precision that's applicable. Uh, for floating point, you can have up to five decimal places for a decimal field up to ten, and then for currency, we typically represent that up to four, um, up to four decimal places, uh, and then you can specify that um, through the currency precision. So displaying uh, displaying information when you when you are displaying whole numbers, for example, um, if you if you choose not to to format it, then it's just displayed. As the integer number, if it represents something like a duration, um, then you can you can choose. Uh, for example, this could be like for a follow-up. It could represent minutes, hours, or days. Uh, a lot of times, if you're going to schedule a follow-up appointment with someone, uh, you can use that duration as well. Or, for example, if you're scheduling a meeting and the duration of the meeting itself, um, you can use that represent it that way as well. Uh, for time zone. Uh, basically, you can choose uh, from a pick list uh, as to how, what time zone you want to be used uh, when it's represented. And then, of course, language. You have the ability to um, to install languages on your uh, Dynamics instance, and then, of course, you can uh, choose how that language is, is represented for that particular, uh, how that number format is represented for that particular field. So when you deal with dates and times, uh, it's always stored as a date time, which is the date and time together. Um, you can display it as a date and time or a date only. Internally within the system, all date times are stored in UTC. Uh, each user has the ability to uh, select what their local time zone is, uh, and then, of course, it will be translated to that user's local time zone in whatever dis uh, preferred display format is represented based on, on how they would like that date time displayed. Uh, to you what part of the world you're in, it can be displayed in a number of different ways. Uh, it does convert uh, to the local time zone, um, even if it's only a date field. So it's just something to consider. And then, of course, you have to make sure that when you're dealing with date fields, you want to um, you want to take into consideration that you know it could there could be variations in the date depending on how you're looking at it as you are represented to a local time zone. So, you know, 8 o'clock here in the afternoon, uh, sorry, in the evening is uh, the 12 a.m. of the next day uh, in, in in London, and, of course, traversing on forward uh, throughout, the, throughout the rest of Europe. So lookup fields. Uh, this is one way that you can actually uh, create a uh, Kind of a simple relationship from an entity perspective. This holds a value that points to uh, another uh, another entity. So, for example, on an opportunity, uh, you may have a primary contact as an example, and this would be a lookup field. The primary contact field on the opportunity would point to the contact entity, and then what gets stored within that field in the actual database is what we call GUID, which in GUID is always our uh, global unique identifier that we use to represent as a primary key value for all of our entities. And then, of course, they don't see the good. What you would see is the primary field of whatever reference is linked. So, as we mentioned here, if you were bringing in uh, a contact, it would be the contact full name that gets displayed as the primary field, and you would identify that, of course, when, uh, when you create the entity. Uh, 
and creating the field as the primary field. Uh, lookups are always associated with one to many relationships, so you would create a relationship potentially between uh, opportunity and contact uh, if one didn't already exist for you, which it does. Uh, but if you were creating a custom entity, for example, you would just create a one-to-many relationship, and then you could add that lookup field on the form and have that represented. Uh, the customer field is a special lookup field that, that has the ability to point, as I mentioned before, to either an account or a contact record. So properties and fields. When you define fields within an entity, you have the, uh, you have the ability to define how they are required. If they are optional, that means there is absolutely no uh, no driving force to compel people to enter that information. If they are business recommended, uh, then then it, it is marked in a way that shows that you know to get their attention uh, that this is something you should enter. You don't have to enter it, but you should. Business required means that when the form comes up, that field is on it. That field has to be entered before the form will either be updated or created. Um, but it is enforced only on forms uh, and built within the, the form manage management logic. Um, you would have to enforce it elsewhere um, yourself. And then, of course, uh, the requirement level can be modified uh, either by business rules or can be modified on client-side JavaScript within the form engine. Uh, it is searchable. Uh, the properties of, of fields are searchable. You also have the ability to define field-level security. Uh, which gives you the ability to uh, create a profile that says, for certain types of users with certain security roles, you can or cannot see this field, you can or cannot modify this field. Um, you also have the ability to define auditing on that particular field, and then you can provide a description uh, that describes what that field actually is. So form types. As we've talked about forms, forms are the way that we visually represent access to an entity, uh, yeah, record at a time uh, format. So when you look at the different types of forms, you have what we call the main form, and this is the, the form that's used by the browser. Uh, it can also be used by our Outlook client. Uh, and then, of course, when you're running uh, the Dynamics 365 for tablets, uh, you can also use that main form as well. Um, but it is responsive and does, and does translate to the mobile platform. You can also create a, uh, a quick create form. So one of the features that we have at Dynamics is the ability to do a quick create, where you can click on uh, click on the plus up at the, at the top of the at the top of your your page, and that will bring up uh, a quick create form that will then let you choose what you want to create. You can go and create it and just enter in some basic information. A lot of times that's handy uh, within a work process. So if a salesperson's on a phone and uh, they're dealing with something and, and something else comes in. They need to make a quick uh, note, maybe a, uh, they want to add a contact, or maybe they're working on something and somebody calls, and they want to add themselves a follow-up. They can do that, or they can go and create a contact really quickly, or, you know, something else that may translate to what they need to then go back and follow up on later. Um, that quick create form is also available, and, and it can be uh, can be customized to an extent. Then a quick view form is basically just a form that you can use to, uh, to, to place within another form that can represent uh, parent record information, parent or related record information within a uh, form of a different entity. Uh, and then lastly, a card form, uh, which is used to present data uh, primarily in, in interactive dashboards. So how is a form structured? Um, forms a, are basically structured in, in, you know, having a header with some basic uh, important information for uh, kind of the overall uh, context of that particular form. Um, you also have the ability to put fields within a footer, uh, although the fields in the footer are read-only. Uh, within the body of the form, uh, it's usually broken up into tabs, uh, and those tabs can be either open or closed. And then within those tabs, you have sections. And then you can also create, uh, within the section, you can create columns containing information. So you have a lot of flexibility in how you can create forms and how you can then manage those forms to present information. Uh, within a section on a form, you have the ability to create uh, additional fields. You can have what we call subgrids. Uh, you can also add uh, charts. You can have what we have uh, called the notes control, which has uh, additional information. You can also uh, use our social pane. Uh, our timeline control now would be nice. 
uh, that, that allows you to then represent different types of information within the single control. You can put iframes in, web resources, uh, thing maps, and, and, and you have lots of other things that you can do. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about is we've been as we've been talking today is subgrid. So a subgrid is basically a way of for the displaying um, related data. So for example, uh, I'm a I'm a salesperson and I have um, I, I have a, a customer that I deal with, and when I look at that customer's information, I want to see all of the opportunities that I have for that customer. So that would be represented using a subgrid. So on the form for what we call the account, uh, when the salesperson goes in and they pull that account up, somewhere on the form within a section would be a subgrid that is then associated to the opportunity entity, and it can bring in the related records that are tied to that account uh, that are opportunities. Uh, they can be unrelated. Uh, typically, it's, it's easier to do it when there's a relationship uh, between the two entities, uh, but you can bring in unrelated fields. It uh, does re require some customization, but certainly it is something that you can do. Normally, you select a view uh, to to use to, to display the information and filter the information within that subgrid. And then, of course, the users can then go and interact with that subgrid. Uh, and they can open up the record uh, for you know for a particular entity within that within that subgrid, and uh, everything else uh, works the same um, like any other view. So on the form designer, when you go and you, you interact with the form designer to create forms within uh, within Dynamics 365, this is typically what you will see. What's represented here uh, is the account form. Uh, normally, uh, you know when you when you are dealing with forms and dynamics, especially for uh, the base entities like account and contact and case or incident, you you will see uh, kind of the out of the box. You can create a new one. Uh, you can copy, you can take one like this and save it as a copy and then make changes to it. Um, we typically recommend that, that you, you leave the default forms. You can disable them if you don't want to, to have them available to your users, but make a copy of the default forms so that you have it, and then you can go in and, and make changes to a copy, and that will allow you to then go and make uh, whatever you want to do, but you can always have a fallback just in case something happens. As you can see, uh, there are fields available on the form. Uh, you can also pick and choose from the list of fields in that particular entity to add to the form. Um, you have a lot of flexibility and control in terms of whether you're displaying a view or a subgrid, uh, as well as, uh, you know, the other types of information that you can display uh, within a form. So another thing that we've talked about is relationships. Normally, relationships are representative of, of, of a relationship between two different types of entities. Uh, this is very similar to a relational model within a database. Uh, you can have a one-to-many or a many-to-one or even a many-to-many. -many. Uh, there are system relationships that come predefined uh, within the system between entities uh, as part of the out-of-the-box system, but you also have the ability to create your own relationships. A lot of times this is handy if you are creating custom entities that store related information to primary entities, or if you have two custom entities that you want to relate to each other, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, and then, for example, uh, normally they are self-referencing. So, for example, if you have a case and then uh, that case has cases underneath it, um, they are the, the reference will, uh, will automatically associate when you uh, create the relationship between those two. So one of the many relationships, as I mentioned before, uh, typically this is something where uh, you want to have it related as a primary piece of information and then secondary information that is related to that primary piece of information. Uh, is, for example, here it shows a one-to-many between account and projects. I had used the example of opportunity. Um, but you have the ability when you go in and you look at the, at the primary account, uh, within the Solution Explorer in Dynamics, which is where you do all of your, your customization activity, uh, it would show as a one-to-many relationship, uh, something that's very handy in terms of being able to understand what's available there. When you go in to create a relationship, you would basically go into uh, the type of relationship that you want to create, and you see those in the, uh, in, in the left-hand pane when you're actually in when you're actually on the entity, you can go and select 
of one-to-many relationships, and it will show you existing one-to-many relationships. You can then click on new and add a new relationship, and it actually uh, takes the primary entity that you're on, and then asks you for the related entity, and then you can describe the relationship, and then you can also create the behavior of that relationship um, and how it chooses to relate. And as you can see here, um, basically it, it, it's aligning when you go to create this, it actually creates it in a way that makes it clear that this is a relationship between two separate entities. You can define whether or not it's searchable. You can define whether or not it's hierarchical. Now, the one thing to consider with hierarchical is that normally that's a relationship to itself versus a relationship to another entity. You can then define the lookup field. So what field drives the basically the foreign key relationship uh, between the, the sub-entity or the, the entity that's that's being displayed as a related entity, and then how that relates back to the primary entity. Um, additionally, when you create a one-to-many relationship, you can also create rules that define how that sub-information exists and persists based on what happens to the parent record. So, so when things happen, for example, to a, an account, uh, if you want uh, the related information to that account, to, to also follow what happens through the account itself, you can define that through this type of relationship. So uh, what which records it actually applies to, uh, what happens, for example, if a record gets orphaned where uh, I have a project that was related to an account, uh, it's no longer related to an account, uh, you would, you know, you can define whether or not those, those, those projects would get deleted when the account gets deleted, for example. And then you also have the ability to, uh, reparent, uh, reparent and, and that changes, puts a new owner in for all of those relationships. And the types of actions that can trigger what we call the cascading behavior, uh, an assign. So for example, when you have a primary entity in the relationship that's assigned to another user, uh, all of the subsequent records that are assigned there can be assigned to that user as well. Uh, when it is shared, uh, you can also control the sharing, or if it's unshared, same again, the cascading behavior. Uh, if it's reparented, where the parent record changes, uh, it can also recreate that association. When you do a merge uh, between two entities, uh, the, the, the entity that comes out of that merge process uh, what happens with those related records that are related between the two? They're brought together. And then, of course, what happens when a record is deleted? If you delete it, you can say delete all of the related records, and, and everything that's associated with that primary record would be as well. So, again, managing the, 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 the rules for doing this cascading operation, uh, you can tell it to cascade all. Uh, so, ultimately, that would say do it on all related records. You can tell it to cascade active. So basically on any records that are active versus records that are historical, uh, cascade user owned. So uh, if that sub record is owned by the same user, then of course that means that it, it's going to behave in a way uh, where that relationship is, is driven by the same owner, uh, how that behavior is, is driven as well when the cascade happens. And then of course, cascade done means don't do anything to any of the, uh, the, the sub records. Anything, when you do these assignments, anything but a none makes the relationship between the two entities what we call a parental relationship. And then, of course, when you do a delete, uh, you have the ability, again, to find the type of delete. If you do a cascade all, then all related records are deleted. Uh, if you say remove link, basically that breaks the association uh, between those two records. Uh, of course, then on a restrict delete, uh, you would only, you would really just try to delete the actual one record. Um, but uh, it does prevent, uh, if a sub-record is deleted, it prevents the primary record, of course, from uh, being deleted if there are sub-records there where they're related. So the, the we talked about the, the parental relationship uh, just a minute ago. So what does that really mean? Uh, uh, basically, in a parental relationship, all rules apply, cascade all. Uh, is the normal behavior that, that happens there. If it's referential, um, there are some, some basic rules that apply, but it does not cascade. Uh, and when it's deleted, it does not delete the related record. It simply removes the, the, the link. Uh, for example, 
If you do a referential with a restrict delete, of course, then that control uh, that behavior is, is managed as well. And then lastly, you can set it up to be uh, configurable cascading, and then you can determine how you want that behavior to actually apply in a given condition. Um, this is critically important to understand as you create entities and create relationships because you want to make sure that all of that related information is being managed appropriately. So just make sure that as you're doing this that you, you get a good sense of these roles and how they apply and how you want them to apply for different types of data. So business rules. Business rules are, 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 are what we have in place uh, within a form to drive the behavior on a form, uh, or if you think about it this way, is the ability that we have to kind of encapsulate a workflow. Now, not the technical workflow, but the actual user's workflow as they go through their process. So, for example, what's the process when a user is working an opportunity? Uh, you can use business rules to drive this. You can also use business rules to drive your, uh, your lead to opportunity close or your, your lead to tax process. Uh, business rules can be can be leveraged in this manner, and they're driven off of forms. So when you create business rules, uh, they are related to an entity, and of course, uh, you apply them to all the forms within the client, and all the clients also display those rules. You can set the scope of the rule uh, to one form or all forms, uh, depending on how you want it to behave uh, when the client interacts with it. And then, of course, on the business, on the form, the business rules are triggered when a record is opened uh, or when a record is changed and it triggers one of the rule conditions. Um, any business rule could potentially be triggered uh, once a particular, particular uh, condition is met, whether or not the form is actually open. And that's handy because if you have a process that's going to drive an information flow, you may not have somebody on that particular, uh, on that particular record at that time, uh, but the things behind the business rule would still invoke and can still invoke actions based on that condition and the rule being met. Um, when you define conditions for a business rule, uh, you, you want to make sure that, that you understand when you're creating conditions, how those conditions behave. And then, of course, you want to make sure that you're, you're testing uh, – typically it's driven by testing a field value, uh, whether something contains data, uh, or not, whether it equals or does not equal, uh, you have the ability to do this, and, and then you also have the ability to compare to uh, another field of the same type or a particular value um, or uh, potentially even a uh, mathematical formula or a date time. Uh, when you create business rules, uh, you always start with a condition. Uh, based on, on that particular uh, Based on that particular condition, there could be one or more actions uh, that are created to take place based on that condition. And so by creating a combination of conditions and actions, uh, you can pretty much do anything on a form or within the context of a, of a, of a business rule or within a business process. And, the, for example, you can set field values, you can clear field values, you can show or hide fields, um, you can set field requirement bubbles. Uh, for, for example, something may be business recommended, but when a particular condition happens, you may change that to business required. Uh, you can validate data and show error messages. And then, of course, you can create business recommendations uh, based on business intelligence uh, uh, that, that's associated to the form. So here's, a, a, here's what the business rule creator looks like within the platform. When you actually go to the form, you click on the business rule. This is what will come up. And then you actually have the ability to drive how the uh, business rule was created. Uh, and then you can create, you can add new conditions. You basically drag and drop. You can actually drag uh, uh, actions underneath the condition. Uh, you can define whether or not uh, it is the positive or negative test of that condition, what actions happen uh, accordingly. You can also chain conditions together so that so that as you're going through, once you start a particular condition and certain things happen, you can then go to the next condition and so on. And you can, again, bring these actions in uh, to, to, to then define what happens for a particular uh, what happens for a particular condition when it's met or when it's not met. When you look at uh, – when you, when you 
want to deal with views. Views are, are again, the way of presenting lists of information. Uh, normally, uh, you want to create filters to make sure that this is, is driven to uh, what is going to be displayed uh, on a given view. Now, all of the normal security applies to a view uh, based on how you have your, your security role set up and how you have your, um, your data visibility uh, set up as well. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in addition to that, you can also uh, create uh, a particular type of information to be displayed when you create a view. As it says here, it's very similar to the SQL WHERE clause. Uh, everything that we do within the view for the query is, is, is stored as Fetch XML. Uh, if you're not familiar with Fetch XML, uh, there's a, a link to our uh, developer information uh, that I'll provide at the end of this presentation that talks about that, and you can actually go and, and look at that. Uh, you have the ability when you when you create uh, when you create the view uh, for the, the conditional uh, criteria. Uh, for example, if you're creating a view that says, uh, uh, you know, on the form of, of where you're displaying the view. Uh, show me, uh, for example, my open opportunities. So when you create the view itself, you would bring up the opportunity entity, and then you would define uh, user equals or owner equals current user. And then when you put that view into a into a, a view that's accessible by that user, whatever a particular user accesses, it's only going to be referenced to that user, not any user that happens to to bring the form up. It will be specific to each user uh, and not provide any other information. Or, for example, uh, maybe you want to see uh, data that represents something that's changed, uh, uh, been updated or modified on is the, is the field that we would reference in the last three months. Uh, we do have uh, things in, in those conditions within the view creation that, that allow you to use that as a shortcut instead of having to define a date range specifically and, and, and try to drive that yourself. So we have that ability to be uh, to be dynamic so that the view is always relevant and the view is always active, and you're not having to go in and change the view every time something related to that particular dynamic condition. Um, so some views are used to display, uh, to directly display records, and others uh, may be kind of the starting point for uh, for looking at other information or, or tying to a chart, uh, essentially within a dashboard. Sometimes you may display a list view of certain information and a chart uh, that, that gives a, a different representation of the same information. And then, of course, there's a number of other features that, that you can do with that. Um, on the columns that, uh, that can be displayed uh, within the view, you just define those columns just like you would. Uh, they're all ones that are related within uh, the primary entity or even potentially um, in, in, in a related entity. You can also display that information as well. Uh, and then you can predefine uh, a sort. Uh, by identifying up the two columns that kind of drive uh, the sorting of what's displayed in the entity uh, from the main entity itself. Uh, custom views. So you have the ability to, to go in. Of course, we have a lot of views that come with, with all of our entities uh, that come out of the box, but you also have the ability to create custom views uh, as well. And, uh, when you when you create these views, you can just take uh, a current existing view and then do a save as and create a new view. So, for example, uh, my open opportunities, as an example. Uh, maybe I want to see my open opportunities that I haven't touched in the last seven days. I can go in and bring up the my open opportunities view, do a save as, and then change the criteria on that view from just the ones where I am the, the, the owner of, uh, current user, for example, me as the user to current owner to, I am the owner, and uh, the modified on hasn't been, it's older than seven days. And then that way, you can actually see a list of opportunities that you haven't interacted with in, a, you know, in the last week, as an example. Um, a little bit different than uh, than, than modifying uh, uh, system views, uh, but uh, certainly, um, you know, this is something where you have the ability to create views that are system-wide versus user views that are specific to a user because we do provide the capability for users to create their own views. Uh, and then they can actually, when they go to, for example, if they were to go to accounts, uh, the, the default system view for them would be my active accounts. They can actually create their own version of my active accounts, make whatever changes they want, and then make that their default view. That's stored as a user view. and, and 
that, you know, it doesn't change the system view, but it allows them to add some customization. So it gives them a little bit of empowerment on accessing information. So when you look at when you look at system uh, system versus versus personal charts and views, so systems are system views are created by your system admin or your system customizer. Uh, they can be included as part of the solution. Uh, they can also be included in in the system or personal dashboards. They're available to all users, and then of course they can be exported uh, as chart as a chart XML file or imported from a chart XML file. For personal views, they're created by an individual user. They're not included in a solution. Uh, they can be included in, in personal, but not system dashboards. So users do have the ability to create their own dashboards, and within their own dashboards, they can put their own views. Very handy if, they, if they, you know each person likes to work a little bit differently. This gives them a bit more control over their environment. And it gives them the feeling that they actually have some control over how they want to see information to make them more productive. Uh, they do have the ability when they create these views uh, and dashboards to share them with other users or teams. Uh, and, and they can be exported as chart XML or they can be imported from a chart XML. So to kind of give you a, a sense of what we're talking about here, here is a sales management dashboard uh, that, that basically Kind of displays open opportunities. Uh, it displays actual revenue by month, uh, opportunities by close probability uh, per individual representative. Maybe this is a, more of a management view. And then, of course, the top open opportunities. Uh, as you can see here, there's a lot of a lot of flexibility in how that information is displayed. Uh, and then you have the ability to kind of control this. And then, of course, these views can also be oriented towards individual users. Uh, versus, and you can represent this for an individual user or each rep versus uh, just this management view where it's a little bit where it's a little bit broader in scope. Extension. So we've talked a bit uh, about customizations, but I want to just uh, just to kind of summarize here. Uh, we do look at at, at at development within the the dynamics world in, in a couple of different ways. So customizations is one way where everything is pretty much done within the tool. Uh, building forms, creating entities, creating attributes for those entities, creating relationships. Uh, all of those things are done within the platform, within the tool itself. And that gives you the uh, the ability to do that type of, of what we call configuration uh, within the tool. Now, we're going to talk a little bit now about extensions and how you can extend functionality within the platform uh, and, and the mechanisms that you can use to do that. So. One of the things that has changed with, with our with our V9 release is that there is no longer a specific SDK package uh, or that gets released as a single file that you then download and, un and unzip and, and, and put within your uh, within your uh, Visual Studio uh, apparatus to do development. You can pretty much now download uh, everything from NuGet. Uh, you can actually find sample code as well uh, in the code directory. Um, and again, I'll give you the link to. I'll give you the link at the end of this discussion today uh, to our uh, to our developer site that uh, we call the developer's guide, but it is actually now kind of a visual representation of the SDK. So as you can see here, um, one of the things that we, we talk about extensibility and what can be modified and how it can be modified, uh, there are several different ways in which you can extend the functionality within Dynamics 365. So, for example, on the server itself, kind of encapsulated within your instance, uh, you can create what we call plugins. Uh, and plugins are represented as, uh, as .NET code, typically built as C-sharp, uh, where you can actually put a plugin interactively into a process, uh, something very simple, for example. Uh, when I'm entering information on a form, I want to make sure that if I'm entering a phone number for a particular person, that that phone number is not on uh, a do not call list, uh, as an example. So I can create a plugin that when I enter in the phone number, I can actually go out and check uh, whatever I have as a do not call list for that phone number and then determine uh, how I want to handle that phone number and maybe provide some additional information back. That could be done as a plugin, uh, which can be interacted and, and invoked on the form. Uh, but it can also be interacted, it can also be invoked 
Um, in a batch mode, for example, if you're running a workflow and the same type of thing happens, that plugin can still be in, in, invoked as well. So there's a number of different ways that the, the, the functionality of the system can be extended. Uh, if, for example, the out-of-the-box functionality doesn't specifically meet your needs, we're, we do provide you these mechanisms. Uh, we all provide pretty much now all functionality via a, a REST API, what we call our web API. Uh, I talked about the plugins already. You do have the ability to create separate applications that can interact with CRM. Uh, you can also create custom reporting. Um, you can go in and within the system itself, you can create workflows or business process flows uh, that are represented as processes. And of course, you can create rules that are represented as business rules or uh, that are based on field values. Um, in terms of in terms of how what we provide to developers to, to be able to be more effective, uh, we provide a lot of information uh, within our doc site. Uh, when you are going to actually develop, there may be things that you need to know. For example, like endpoints uh, and specific uh, ways to, to to connect with your Dynamics instance, and that's where this information is stored. So. If you, if you go to your Dynamics instance and you go to Settings and you go to Customization, you will see under the Customization menu a Developer Resources section, and this is what you'll see there. So if, for example, you're looking for the name of your endpoint to interact with uh, the Web API, uh, you will see that, uh, as well as uh, how you could potentially connect uh, your apps to the Dynamics 365 Discovery Service. So maybe you're building an app that you don't necessarily want them to enter the specific URL, if you want them to enter their user ID and then behind the scenes make the determination of what URL to use, you could use the discovery service. Uh, that's one way to do that. Uh, if you want to connect with the Azure Service Bus Listener that's associated with that particular Dynamics instance, we provide you that endpoint as well. So this is where you'll find a lot of uh, a lot of that particular information. In, in terms of uh, web services, what we offer, so. Uh, one of the things that we offer is uh, with the Web API is the ability to interact with the instance. Pretty much uh, all of the functionalities that was within our old SOAP endpoint uh, exists within the uh, Web API. We, uh, we have deprecated uh, the, the SOAP functionality, so there won't be any improvements uh, or enhancements to the SOAP functionality. It is still supported, uh, and you can still use the SOAP endpoint, uh, but we are recommending that everyone uh, begin to start using our web API and interacting with the system in that way. So when you connect to Dynamics using uh, the web API, what do you do? Well, this follows the very standard, uh, the very standard web development and web service development model. So you will authenticate with OAuth. Uh, we do have, we do support the ability to leverage MFA for that process. Uh, all of that comes in through Azure AD, uh, and then depending on how your authentication is set up for your particular Dynamics uh, tenant that you may be uh, federated, which is where it's driven through um, ADFS or some other identity provider uh, and goes back to your system to then do the actual authentication. Or it could be that using their sync or some other mechanism. But the idea is that when you go to authenticate against a Dynamics instance, it's always going to talk to Azure AD, and then Azure AD may be talking to something else in the back end. It will provide a valid token, and then the user goes forward. One of the questions that we get a lot, and I'll just sidetrack here for one second, one of the questions that we get a lot related to this is, well, what is my authentication option within Dynamics? Well, there isn't one. All authentication coming into the tenant is controlled by Azure AD. So it's the same authentication that is used for Office 365 services uh, within that same tenant, uh, as well as any other services that are associated with that tenant. And it's all controlled by uh, both potentially Azure AD, as well as your on-premise AD if you have that relationship set up. Um, if you are doing web development, uh, you know, I'm sorry, if you're doing HTTP and, and uh, a very simple web development, we do recommend that you use the, uh, the, uh, the Azure uh, authentication library, the ADAL library, uh, it's very uh, very powerful and it offers a lot of uh, offers a lot of uh, flexibility and functionality in terms of how you do authentication. And that's the if you use those calls uh, that are provided in that library, it simplifies the authentication process for you. Um, if you do want to create a custom application to to access Dynamics through uh, through this process, it's called a, a model called a single page application model, and there's documentation. Uh, 
uh, within within the actual documentation online that talks about how to use what we call the SPA model for uh, authenticating it and interacting with Dynamics 365. Um, here's a, a simple walkthrough of, of registering an SPA application. So you would actually go within Azure AD, you would register your SPA application. Uh, you would then define the you would then define the interaction and the entity that you want to interact with, and then it displays a very simple screen. This is actually sample code, and the link is here. Uh, this link will be available to you, of course, as part of the presentation uh, after today. Uh, but this actually walks you through uh, the whole process of doing this, setting up your app, and then actually interacting with a with a dynamic system. So I mentioned plugins previously. So what are plugins? Uh, plugins again are a way to extend the dynamic functionality on the server side uh, of, of the uh, of the interaction. So when you're interacting from wherever you are, your PC, you're on the client side. But if you want the behavior to basically be there for all users uh, across a particular entity or a number of entities, or you're creating, you want to extend and change or modify functionality, plugins are the way to do that. Uh, it's, it's basically code that you create that is, is brought across as uh, a .NET assembly, uh, and then you can you can create how that .NET assembly interacts with the with the system, depending on on what triggers it and what drives it um, to interact and what it does. Now, the code within it is actually the functionality that it does, but you then also have to go in for that plugin and create how that plugin goes and interacts with the system once it's invoked. So to understand this, what does that really mean and how is that invocation really driven? Uh, let's talk a little bit about our event execution pipeline. So what this does is this says, okay, there are a number of stages that events go through within the Dynamics platform. And, and I want to be able to interact uh, at a certain point. Now, just so that you understand um, the, the where you look here, you have a couple of different options. You can basically do pre-operation main operation or post operation. And what that means is, um, what this basically means is, for example, for pre-validation, maybe there's something that you want to do um, to, to delete some information or potentially you want to do something before a create form is invoked. Um, you, may want to, you may want to make sure that you want to do things, for example, uh, once the security validation is done on a given form, uh, you want to make sure that you want to do something to information before uh, the data is written back as a commit to the database. So on an update, for example, you want to check to make sure uh, information is there uh, before that record is actually written. Maybe you want to remind the user, hey, no, you need to enter these pieces of information as well. Uh, and then, of course, on a post information, on a post operation, it's triggered after security validation and then still within the database, but after the commit is fired. So, for example, I go in and I create an opportunity. And now I want to go and create a reminder for myself or a follow-up appointment with an individual based on the creation of that opportunity. Once that opportunity has been created and the commit inspired, then you can go in and say, make my plug-in, go and create a new, a new appointment for me to follow up with this individual after, after it has been created. So how do you create plugins? As I mentioned before, plugins are uh, C-sharp code. And uh, we provide uh, a lot of uh, out-of-the-box assemblies to allow you to then uh, leverage and create plugins to, to do the things that you need to do. I use Visual Studio for that. Uh, and then you also want to make sure that you, are, you, you do include uh, all of the assemblies that, that provide all of the code, uh, the, the, the core code that allows you to do that interaction. And then, of course, you want to make sure that you are uh, creating it in a way that uh, is, is valid. If you use our templates and you do those things, once you've created the assembly, you then can actually use what we call the plugin registration tool. You go in and actually register the assembly and then define the plugins that are within it and how they behave. So this is where you would drive the behavior. So this is where, for example, within an assembly, there's a plugin. You talk about that plugin and how it's going to how it's actually going to behave on what entity and how it's invoked. Uh, this is critical to understand uh, because as you create plugins, if you don't really understand this, you can create a plugin that fires needlessly 
for uh, for a lot of different actions. You have to be very careful to make sure you're, you're firing on the right message uh, for the right entity, and then that way that plugin will only invoke when you want it to. And it's a it's a good performance uh, best practice just to make sure that you're aware of that. Uh, and then that way, just make sure before I leave this topic, I'm going to go back here one second. The other thing here with plugins is is to make sure that when you're building functionality for plugins, there's always the tendency because you're writing code to put a whole lot of things within one plugin. Uh, I would tell you from a best practice perspective that the plugins function best when they are very atomic in functionality. Uh, do not make them complicated. Do not try to add a lot of layered functionality in there because, of course, that always has an impact on your user experience. So if you keep those plugins fairly simple and focused in scope, uh, and then, of course, make sure when you register them that you register them appropriately, uh, you will get the, the most optimal user experience out of that. So now, in terms of controlling functionality, extending functionality on the server side, uh, the plugins are primarily the way to do that. On the client side, you would do this through what we call client-side scripting. Uh, this is all basically done with JavaScript. Uh, we do provide uh, we do provide some some capabilities uh, to help you do client-side scripting if it's necessary. Uh, something that uh, you want to make sure that when you're when you're looking at this type of functionality that you are that you are thinking about what types of things make more sense to happen on the client. Uh, versus happening on the server side. For example, uh, customers who have very strict rules about what comes in and out of their environment, uh, sometimes maybe accessing a, uh, a system within your own environment uh, is better done from the client side than it is from uh, from the server side, where we would do what we call a callback plugin uh, that, that can actually call back into your environment. So uh, just something to consider when you're looking at server side versus client side uh, extension, what makes more sense. Uh, but we do provide a lot of capabilities uh, to do this. Uh, and like I said before, it does allow you to kind of think about what makes sense to be done on the server side versus what can be done on the client side. Uh, we do support it on, 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 on basically on all platforms. We support it on the browser. Uh, we support it on tablets. We support it on phones. Uh, we also support uh, uh, the API if you're going to do what we call offline access. Uh, this is something that, that this can still be invoked. And, and your forms will function the way that you would expect them to uh, to function. Uh, and looking at events, so when you look at events uh, in terms of how you are, are managing things on the client side, uh, there are a number of different events that get fired uh, as part of the form control, uh, and uh, basically you have the ability to interact with those events and do things on the client side just like you do we were talking a little bit about on, on the server side, how you interact with those within the uh, event pipeline. So when you look at this from a, a client perspective, uh, there are a lot of different events here that you can interact with depending on whether you're on a form uh, or whether you're within uh, a field, uh, uh, whether or not you're, you're dealing with a, a particular tab or an iframe. Uh, we also provide functionality to interact with, with both grids and subgrids. So you do have some uh, customization capability uh, on, on the client side, when uh, they're interacting with a subgrid, maybe you want uh, a certain type of behavior to happen uh, when they invoke a, a record off of a subgrid, uh, you can control how that behavior happens. Uh, and maybe you know, there's some pre-processing or post-processing that you want to take place there that you don't want to put on the server side. Uh, and then, of course, same thing in interacting with uh, both workflows and business processes, uh, and then, of course, on the lookup as well. So. Uh, you know, for example, if, if there's something that you're doing on a particular lookup where uh, maybe you pre-pinned information and it's, and it's actually stored but the user's not aware of that, uh, you can intercept that with the pre-search and, and do, uh, make that quick addition that it needs to before it actually goes into the search so that it's pulling back the relevant information that you wanted to display. Um, as I mentioned here, there's a, there's a lot of information within this, and the, some of the links at the end of the discussion will, will point you to it to begin to give you a lot more detail about how all of this works, but certainly just to give you a good sense of, of how this behavior works, uh, you have the uh, ability to, to really do a lot of extension on the client side as well by interacting with these types of events. So what is the uh, client API object model? So the client, the, the client API object model basically allows you to, this is what provides the objects and methods that, that you can interact with. Uh, 
uh, taking advantage of, of the event, uh, as well as, you know, understanding how you can then create this extension on the client side. Um, you do have the ability to, to get the execution context, so where you are uh, on a form or a grid and what you're doing. Uh, the form context gives you control or access to a lot of the, form, uh, the controls on the form. It gives you the ability to interact with those controls, whether it's, you know, checking the value that's in a particular field or, uh, you know, or maybe making something visible or not visible uh, or making it enabled or disabled. Uh, those types of things you have the ability to do through the form context. Uh, which is a grid context, you have the ability to, to interact with a grid or a subgrid on a form uh, and, and control specific actions on the grid. And then finally, uh, what we call the XRM context, this is the global object that, that encapsulates all of these other uh, capability, uh, these other objects, sorry, uh, that would then allow you to uh, interact more broadly with, with, the, with the system, uh, things that, that basically uh, don't necessarily just control the data or uh, forms or grids or subgrids, but that there are some other things that you can do, other information that you can get to within the broader context outside of each of these individual contexts. So when we consider all these things and we really want to understand where we're going with this and what we're doing, what are what are good best practices to follow. Um, this is, of course, not a completely comprehensive list, but, but certainly we want to try and point out the things that, that we've seen uh, tend to cause users the most grief in the implementations that we've worked uh, from a fast track perspective. Um, these are things that, that, you know, as you're, as you're going through and you're doing uh, your configuration, your customization, your development, if you will, to, to kind of keep an eye on. So one thing that, that's important is uh, when you create uh, option sets, um, you really do not want to include an option set in a quick fund. Uh, and the reason for this is because uh, it helps to, to control uh, the, the, the performance of, of a quick fund. Uh, it certainly it creates, a, 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 if you will, kind of a number of additional uh, potential options that, that, that could be done, so it kind of expands the amount of data. You really don't want to do that. You want to keep your quick finds very simple and very focused. Uh, in terms of kind of general performance, uh, when you are creating queries and you're, and you're leveraging these queries, uh, either in code or, or in JavaScript, you want to make sure that you are uh, dealing with a, a column set. A lot of times when, especially we see this a lot of times with people developing plugins, uh, when they're creating a query as part of a plugin or as part of a, a custom action, they do not include specific fields in the column set. They just allow it to pull all fields back, which is very inefficient. So when you're using a column set, you want to make sure that you are only bringing back the pieces of information that are actually critical to what you're doing in that moment. Um, you also want to make sure that uh, you know, while it's not necessarily uh, necessary anymore, you should always specify no lock just to be safe. Um, and then, of course, um, lastly, you want to make sure that as you are pulling information back, that you are aware if there are what we call multiple pages. So um, when you get a lot of records back, as you can see here in the model that, that's presented, um, we're going through, there's a, a more a more records indicator uh, within the collection, and basically what we're doing is we're checking the collection to see if there's more records. Uh, we paginate this to bring uh, to make the management of, of those uh, those records easier, especially in extremely large record sets. So you want to make sure that you're aware of that when you're interacting with those, that you're managing that pagination um, uh, correctly. Uh, don't just look at the first page that's returned. That may or may not be uh, everything that you need. You may have to go through uh, more of the pages, and then you just want to make sure that you're doing that as efficiently as possible, and you're using that information to help you manage how you how you perform with your data. So another thing from a performance perspective, uh, you want to make sure that when you are interacting uh, with the system uh, that you batch your request into a single web service call. Uh, for example, this is what we call our execute multiple. Uh, you want to make sure that you are, for example, if you're creating records, instead of creating records one at a time, uh, we are calling what we call the create request that you actually create a batch of these requests within an execute multiple request. Uh, this puts the, the processing off of you and 
puts it over onto the server. Uh, so you can put up to a thousand records in a single execute multiple request, and then uh, that goes over to us, and then we will begin to process uh, those thousand requests. Uh, and then we will, you have options when you create the execute multiple on how you want responses back, whether you want it to continue even if an error occurs, and how you want to handle the information that comes back from the execute multiple. Um, and, you know, we talk about uh, network latency. So, for example, if you're running this uh, within your environment, uh, within your corporate network, and you're interacting with uh, the dynamic instance, if you find that there's a, a, a bit of latency uh, between that, you know, within that interaction, uh, you know, you may want to use the batch request instead of doing uh, individual create calls. But, you know, ultimately you have to kind of look at these things and, and decide what's the best path for you. Um, we don't necessarily recommend that uh, that you, you know, from an on-prem perspective where you're not going to have a lot of latency, you really don't need execute multiple, uh, you have uh, a bit more control over how those requests are managed and how many requests you can you can hit the uh, the server with any given time because, of course, you have all of that within your network infrastructure. But from a service perspective, we do have some things that we do to, to kind of keep things balanced and, and keep uh, available load capacity for all users using the service. So uh, this is a, a very uh, effective way of doing, uh, like, for example, data import um, or ongoing data migration, as an example, uh, as well as uh, potentially if you need to go through and, and, and make a lot of modifications to a, you know, to a particular entity or data set, uh, this is another way that you can do that very effectively. Um, when you're executing a plugin, uh, you want to make sure that if you are calling web services that you disable keep alive. Uh, that's the, just from a performance perspective, uh, you want to make sure that, that that connection is not being kept alive if something's happening on the other side. You want that timeout to invoke. You want it to fire. You want to make sure that because if that connection something happens with that connection, you're not getting a response. You don't want that hanging. Um, you also don't want to make sure that it's trying to use uh, expired sessions. So these are all things that you need to uh, keep an eye out for. Um, when uh, when a particular plugin is executed, uh, it is cached. Uh, the object is not not disposed. So you know you do want to make sure that you're aware of that. You want to make sure don't use global variables. Um, you know there is no there is no threat safety. Uh, you have to be very careful in terms of how you're dealing with it. You want that to be atomic, so you do not want to do something again. As I said, you want your plugins to be simple. So I would not go and create, uh, you know, multi-thread interactions within within a single plugin because you know, we're not guaranteed your thread safety is not guaranteed there. So you want to keep it uh, isolated that user, and then within that execution and user execution context, you are safe. But you, you are you don't want to go very complicated and start to try to create these. Uh, multi-thread plugins is not not advised. Um, you can uh, you want to make sure that that when you are when you're building when you're building your plugins that you are, are leveraging uh, static variables uh, just because it, 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 it performs more efficiently. Uh, and you want to make sure that that you do these things to kind of keep the behavior as clean and, and as performant as possible. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, you want to make sure that you want to avoid unnecessary plugin execution. So when you go through and you're registering your plugin, uh, you want to understand how that plugin is registered and make sure that it is only registered for the specific MD, maybe even down to the field level, for the specific context in which you want it to fire. Uh, that will make your system much more performant, um, and, and, and it will actually allow you to, to keep your execution much cleaner uh, and avoid you know, things happening that, that may not be uh, readily explainable without doing a little bit of deeper research and uh, and, and investigation. So, uh, if, if for example, when you're when you're working with your plugins, when you're working uh, with these things, you want to make sure that you are handling exceptions effectively, uh, that you're capturing them uh, for your on, on your own side, and that you are handling exceptions that come back from system calls. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using, for example, the invalid plugin execution exception class. Uh, this way, uh, it, 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 it reports effectively and cleanly. It gives you the ability to see that through uh, the tracing, the plugin tracing functionality within the, the platform. Use the eye tracing service uh, as well as the plugin profiler. Uh, this will give you more, uh, more better understanding of plugin execution and what's happening, as well as being able to again see uh, what happens within the uh, what happens within the uh, what happens within the service and, and how that information is captured on, on errors. And then lastly, from an exception handling perspective, uh, don't catch generic exceptions. 
and, and then make sure that you are dealing with your coach blocks appropriately. Um, uh, on the client side, when you're invoking JavaScript, uh, avoid invoking synchronous calls. Uh, do everything that you can asynchronously and make sure that you're managing that uh, make sure that you're managing that effectively because that then again prevents uh, unseen delays in your user experience. Um, it, it's just a, it's just a cleaner um, it's just a cleaner way of of, of creating uh, client side extension functionality uh, that you want to take advantage of. Uh, on the forms themselves within the platform, uh, when you initially open a form, you may have a lot of tabs of information. Uh, we recommend that you collapse those, uh, and then that way you only open them when you need them. That helps optimize your form performance as, as it doesn't have to worry about it. kind of loads it in the background and kind of prepares the, the rendering in the background so that you don't have to worry about it. It brings up the information that, that needs to be seen right away as quickly as possible. Um, we don't recommend uh, we don't like to recommend redirection within forms. Uh, we'll make sure that you don't try to make a form invoke itself, for example, or have a form invoke uh, another form within itself. We also want to make sure that you don't have multiple quick view forms on a given form, as that can have a, a, a significant impact on performance. Uh, JavaScript itself, uh, we do not support uh, end user manipulation of the DOM directly. Uh, the primary reason for this is because we've provided a lot of uh, a lot of context information and objects for you to interact with the form. Uh, if you go directly into the DOM and make modifications, those are things that may change underneath you in the future. Um, and it, it's not upgradable, so that's why it's not supported. And then, of course, there are some other um, some other types of, of JavaScript coding that are unsupported. Uh, and then we provide a code validation, a custom code validation tool uh, that can help you in uh, identifying some of those uh, some of those unsupported actions within the code. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, here's some resources that uh, are available to you. We no longer uh, we do no longer distribute the quote unquote SDK uh, as a distributable uh, file. Uh, we now provide everything via our doc site. So uh, the top link there in the resources is the actual doc site itself. It's kind of the top level doc site for Dynamics 365. You could actually just go to docs.microsoft.com and you'll see docs for all of our products. Uh, it's a very useful site. I use it a lot myself. Uh, but for Dynamics, you can actually go to Dynamics 365 and there is again additional information there. Uh, if you go under integrate, customize, and develop, uh, you will see sections for customer engagement as well as finance and operations. Uh, under the customer engagement uh, section, you will see uh, that, that there's a link for the overview. I would recommend you start there. There's a lot of information there on customization. Uh, follow the links, drill down into them, and, uh, and make sure that you uh, that you spend some time kind of understanding the, the flow of information that's in existing. You'll find that a very helpful tool as you go forward. Uh, and then lastly, of course, for developers, uh, for doing extensions, um, you can go to the actual developer guide for customer engagement, which is a, a page now within our doc site that contains a lot of great links to information. It contains links to sample code, a lot of information on how to use NuGet, as we were talking about, for, for doing uh, Visual Studio development with plugins. And, uh, and certainly, uh, those are the types of, of, of information that you will find extremely helpful. So uh, in, in terms of my presentation itself, uh, that is it. Uh, I have already seen some questions uh, come up, so uh, we can start. Uh, we can start going through, and, and, and I'll just answer them. So, uh, the question on RCSI. So, um, you don't have to worry about RCSI getting set. That's done by default now. It's not something that you have to worry about from an online perspective. That really only matters if you're on prem. You want to make sure that your database on prem uh, has RCSI set. RCSI set. Uh, or, or know that setting if you're interacting with it programmatically. So you just need to make sure when you interact with your DBAs that you find out whether RCSI is set on premise. Online, it doesn't matter anymore. It's all taken care of behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, will the presentation be made available for download? Absolutely. Uh, I believe so. Uh, Janice can probably tell us, uh, give us a, maybe a, an approximate time frame. I'm not sure exactly when that will be. But uh, I don't know, Janice, it would, it would be available just via Q, or would they be able to download the, uh, the deck as well? 
Uh, we'll make it available um, during download for the on-demand recording, and they'll find the location in a follow-up email. Right, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then is the custom code validation tool something we could use in unit testing? Uh, it's not really a unit testing uh, you could, uh, but it's really kind of designed to look more broadly uh, at, your, at your JavaScript. You, you could use it piece by piece like that. But it's probably better to just because it evaluates your entire solution. So it's probably better to just look at it, let it run once you've kind of got your solution done uh, before you're ready to then, you know, propagate it maybe as a last step. Uh, I would say that it's not a unit testing tool. It's more of a once I, my developers have done their basic unit testing, then we'll run the validation tool to make sure that there's something that's not there. The other thing, too, I'll tell you, as you become familiar with best practices, this isn't something that you need to run very often. Um, this really does tell you more, are you following best practices, or, or is there any unsupported code? Uh, if you're controlling your own environment, then you should be okay. Almost all of our, 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 our ISVs that, that create custom code uh, do all of this before they ever ever publish a solution. Uh, if you do have concerns, it's something you could, you know, you ask them, have you guys run this? Do you have any unsupported JavaScript within your solution? But, but typically, our ISP is really good about not doing that. So not something that you typically have to worry about. Normally, this is something that as you – maybe you have a home system, uh, maybe a, a version 3 or version 4 system, uh, and you're migrating, and you want to know, okay, I did a lot of these things. They were supported and weren't specifically covered one way or the other in version 3 or version 4 or even 2011. Uh, I want to make sure that as I'm moving forward, uh, I'm no longer doing those things that I should be doing. That's really where that custom code validation tool uh, comes into play. Any other questions? That's all we have in the queue right now. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask any more questions, go ahead and, and type your question into the white text box and send it on in, and uh, Chris will answer it. In the meantime, I'd like to take a moment here and bring your attention to a link that I posted in the messages panel. That's a link to a short survey for this web conference. We ask that you please take a moment before logging out to access it. We hope that you found today's information helpful, and if you enjoyed today's web conference, have feedback on how we can provide you a better event, or you would like to submit topics for future web conferences, this is your chance to let us know. The survey scores are on a scale from 1 to 5, with 5 being the highest score possible. I'm going to go ahead and give just a couple more moments to see if any questions come in. Chris, are there any final thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, actually. So uh, I do want to say to, to everyone on the call, thank you very much for attending today. Uh, I really appreciate your time. And uh, we absolutely would, would like your feedback because we want to know if what we're doing has value for you, if this information is valuable, if these types of, of presentations of our tech talks from a fast track program perspective uh, are valuable to you. Uh, so, so please let us know that. Uh, please make sure to go through and, and answer the questions in the survey. Uh, I certainly appreciate your feedback as well. Uh, and I know that uh, as you go through this process, uh, there's a lot of information that we've covered today. Please make sure and, and follow the, the documentation links and go and really spend time. I think you'll find it very valuable. And it's certainly uh, pretty much any question that you can think of is out there, uh, and, and, and the information for it is out there as well. So happy coding and, and good luck, and thank you all very much if there are no further questions. All right. Thank you, Chris. We do not have any further questions. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to conclude today's web conference. Attendees can access the web conference recording at the same registration site within 24 hours. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Chris, and thank you, audience, for logging in and joining us today.